His last mission was completed a day earlier and after a short period of deep sleep three cats nestled at his feet. The pilot of the stealth interceptor fighter Zuan, the Zuiz, had just woken up. His next rest period would not be before 56 Earth hours, and in 48 hours on Thursday, August 18, at 9.27 CET, it would be a full moonlight and human emotions on Earth would be exacerbated. Hello, I am the Interstellar Mediator, Sol 13, Terra 3. I have been a hermit, a forest monk in Asia. I have traveled to many countries around the world where I have lived for dozens of years, including France, the USA and India. I was a university professor in language sciences and I also have a background in visual arts. I have a family and I am a writer. I have been in contact with extraterrestrials of various lineages and solar systems between March 2016 and the end of April 2021. I was born on July 14th. I am 73 years old. The following testimony is not at all from a science fiction movie or a futuristic novel. This is an excerpt from hundreds of live, written, and oral conversations I had with an alien pilot, written by him and saved on my computer. All the details are precise. What he looks like, his physical, mental and spiritual characteristics, such as his height, the way he lives or dresses, what he eats, what he says, his environment and how he evolves in space, his traditions, the way he pilots his spaceship, were conveyed by him, black on white, in direct communications with me. This is not telepathy nor channeling at all. Here is the first part of Luna Incognita, unknown moon. Thank you for listening and for your support. See you soon. Captain Ellis yawned his head off as he stretched his 6.49 feet of muscles and glanced drowsily at the screen. It didn't indicate any emergency. The day is going to be quiet, he thought, feeling relieved. He gently chased the cats towards the pneumatic door, which opened with a barely perceptible whisper, and they fled in the corridor, running past his private quarters. He took a shower, cut his beard as short as possible, and then placed his head under the dryer and the artificial intelligence did his hair automatically. He was a Nordic type 
with white skin that had become almost diaphanous after a prolonged stay in space. He had short hair, tropical blue eyes, and long, slender fingers intended for precision work. He was ambidextrous and could use either the left hand or the right one, or both at the same time. He was calm and very patient. He was one of those who have suffered and who knows how to stay happy in the moment. He was loved, solitary, different. He put a spandex Kevlar protective suit that fit him like a second skin, which he liked for its flexibility and comfort. The smart nanotechnology material recomposes itself automatically. It never tears off and can take any given shape instantly. It is extremely resistant to all types of impact and contains biometric and telemetry sensors that measure physiological data and make a diagnosis while putting pressure on an injury in the event of an attack. Over it, he donned a black uniform with the Zirconia mothership insignia on his chest and his solar system emblem on his shoulder. He had a belt with an electromagnetic pulse defense weapon and a small detector for his geolocation in case of an emergency. Then he put on thick socks where he left some space at the tips of the toes because he didn't like the rubbing of the fabric on his skin and a pair of flexible and strong combat boots. His helmet and gloves were already in the cockpit. Zia, his own personal artificial intelligence, continuously measured his physiological parameters, heart and respiratory rates, blood pressure, temperature, tyresis and body mass index, and hundreds of other functions, skeletal, muscular, endocrine, lymphatic and immune systems, respiratory, digestive, reproductive, excretive systems, fluid compartments, different tissues, nervous system and sense organs. Captain Ellis mentally ordered the analysis display and a 3D holographic screen floated before his eyes. Hello, Captain Ellis. You are in good shape today. Eat fruit at breakfast to increase your glucose levels. Good morning, Zia. Okay, will do. Thus began Captain Ellis' long day on the Zirconia, one of the ships that are stationed behind the moon, where no Earth radars could detect them. He went out of his cabin, turned right, and took the same path as the cats. He went to the command center to check in with the captain. Then he consulted the assignment board. He was to assist the Zirconia, which was leaving on a reconnaissance flight in high Earth's orbit and pass in front of the near side of the moon, a destination 
that could prove dangerous because both ships could be detected by astronomers and their telescopes. And besides the surprise effect at their mammoth size, they could be attacked. To no avail, of course, because the artificial intelligence could not only change the harmonics of the ship's defense shield and make them invisible, but Zia could also detect the frequencies of events. The launch of a missile changes the frequency of space-time, and Zia could detect it, open a torus to teleport both ships to an alternative reality, and they would disappear in a snap. Sometimes, zealous military pilots would hunt him down, and when they did, he would have fun challenging them and engaging in a competition. He could hear their comments on the onboard radio. It was whoever would give the highest speed and altitude. Chasing a UFO was always exhilarating to tell friends on social media. But the pilots would anyway still be beaten and dispersed, dismayed at the speed of the UFO they were trying to overtake. Then Captain Ellis went to the officers' mess. It was bustling, packed with crew members who, like him, had just arrived or pilots returning from their missions. He exchanged a few words telepathically with two friends on the conditions of land flights, helped himself with two slices of freshly baked bread, two rackets of slides, no palace. The leaves of the tricky pear, Opuntia fincus indica, that are served at breakfast treats, and he liked for its high content of vitamins C and E. He added a half papaya and a glass of naturally sweetened orange juice. He was a vegan, and despite his build, he ate little and not what has a face, as he called meat or fish. He swallowed it all down quickly and took a cup of energizing herbal tea to the solarium. While savoring it in long, refreshing sips, he cuddled in an armchair in front of a huge panoramic bay window overlooking space. It is as large as the entire width of the ship from left to right and floor to ceiling. With the exception of a 200-yard boomery filled with detectors and sensors in front of the vessel, the view was unobstructed and he could contemplate the magnificent spectacle of the cosmos. It was breathtaking. He felt privileged to be able to admire what few people had the opportunity to see. He felt like he was floating in space without a safety teaser. He began to think of Earth scientists who state that 95% of the structure and the movement of the universe consist of dark matter. But almost all the matter he perceived is not visible to Earthlings. On Earth, an observer's vision is defined by a wavelength between ultraviolet and infrared. 
What earthlings see is only a tiny percentage of a much larger electromagnetic spectrum and they conclude that what is invisible is dark matter. If a scientist could have seen what he was seeing right now, they would be stunned by the infinite range of colors and by the very essence of the cosmos. As far as the eye could, thousands of spacecrafts were stationed about 10-15 miles away around a gigantic triangular space station, a kind of cosmonautic airport open to countless non-terrestrial species, extraterrestrials. It is as long as France, 503 miles, extends over a third of its width, 186 miles, and 31 miles in height. Her name is Androsol 13. When Captain Ellis, in his stealth fighter, arrives at the median landing pad where his parking shed is located, he could see miles of floors above and miles of floors below. It was impressive and a wonder of celestial mechanics. From a distance, the ship looked like a huge city floating in space with all windows lit and flashing lights. Active like a swarm of bees, all kinds of vessels ranging from light to massive, were in motion or moored. They were as varied as the crews to which they belong, sphere, triangle, cube, cylinder, pyramid, diamond, elongated hue, candelabra, or artichoke. There were many gigantic spherical biospheres, military bases, intelligence center ships, warships, numerous stealth interception or attack fighters, and diplomatic vessels. All these space vehicles are served by relay shuttles, identical to those you know, small round UFOs on three legs, called Tic Tac or Scout ships. And in this traffic, worthy of the great land-based traffic jams, there also are freighters arriving from unknown planets to supply the crews with goods, state-of-the-art technological gadgets, spare parts, food, water, and everything else needed to leave aboard a spaceship cut off from the rest of the world for years. They also deliver small vehicles stored in their holds and are sometimes used by personnel to travel from a ship back to the planet they arrived from or vice versa to join a crew. Seen from Earth, these huge spaceships, which regularly pass in front of the Moon, 900 of which are in high Earth orbit, can be picked up by astronomers who have a thousand magnification power telescope. Many witnesses film them wondering what these moving particles are that cross the skies at unprecedented speeds. 
Other ships that are locked to the lunar orbit will not be visible since the Moon rotates synchronously with the Earth. He then saw a large metallic grey sphere covered with countless structures on its surface. It was the far side of the Moon, which was the near side for him. And further away, at arm's length, he could also see a beautiful sphere the size of a blue orange, the Earth, here called Terra III. In other ships of the same category as the Zirconia, the gigantic room where he was gathers the necessary means for the operational management of the various missions. It is filled with computers, monitors, consoles and trained crew members seated in front of screens much like the Lyndon B. Johnson Control Center in Houston, Texas when launching a spaceflight. But on the Zirconia, whose mission is scientific research, the room is completely empty and only an uninterrupted crystalline bay window. On the floor, there are rare carpets and in the back, a snack bar, the mess, and there are comfortable sofas to take a rest after a surveillance or rescue mission or just for the pleasure of stargazing. Captain Ellis reluctantly left his observation post and took a shuttle to the hangar where his fighter, the Zuiz, was parked next to 12 others. The Zoo One is long and tapered like the tip of an arrow. It is 328 feet long and 98 feet wide. It is managed by Zia, an artificial intelligence which is entirely and specifically dedicated to Captain Ellis and the very extension of his own mind. Captain Ellis and Zia are one. When Captain Ellis thinks something, Zia thinks it simultaneously and vice versa. The Zuis, identified as Zu 1-A551, was the first version of a new class of high-performance ships with more advanced technologies. She was in the inaugural flight phase, standing on six large landing struts, her nose pointed towards the void. The entrance is at the front, under the cockpit. As soon as Captain Ellis approaches, Zia checked his DNA frequency, which is the vessel's entry key to the fighter, and slowly lowers the access ramp. Captain Ellis checked the hydraulic pistons and removed the tarpaulin protecting the ship. All Earth or space pilots are required to perform certain pre-takeoff checks, carefully study the weather conditions, control their aircraft inside and outside to ensure there are no anomalies. Captain Ellis undertook a meticulous pre-flight inspection, checking the fuselage to make sure everything was clear before climbing the access ramp. He appeared in the cargo hold. It was empty at this time, but could carry two SUVs with 
passengers. He passed through a narrow corridor flanked by the flashing onboard computer consoles and arrived in the cockpit. Seven mobile seats were distributed in pairs along the central L. He sat in the middle and moved the seat forward. The arms of the seat belt fastened him immediately while he mentally instructed Zia. Engines on. The holographic screen in front of him lit up and all the basic data was displayed as Zia spelled out the flight conditions. He checked the mouse of the plasma gun cannons through the transparent walls and set the inertia dampers to 96% to feel the acceleration. At 100%, he could have continued to savor his herbal tea without realizing that he was flying even at several times the speed of light. The struts retracted and the ship levitated about 13 feet above the ground, stationary, ready for takeoff. Captain Ellis put his helmet and his gloves on, grabbed the controls on the left and the steering lever on the right, and after receiving the authorization, he thought, Take off. Zia slowly autopiloted the vessel, following the line of lit indicators leading to the edge of the hangar. As the ship crossed the electromagnetic field that served as a door and separated it from the vacuum of space, blue electrostatics sparked the fuselage. Captain Ellis moved away from the hangar to be at a safe distance, then pushed the controls and the turbines fully picked up. The ship darted into the void at the speed of a lightning flash. Head for the moon. Zia steered the vessel and modified the frequencies of everything on board to compensate for the extra mass due to acceleration. They were flying towards the moon at high speed without any trace of combustion behind the aircraft because it is powered by free energy and toroidal propulsion dynamics. Zia announced Target at 1 minute and 12 second Target at 1 minute and 12 second Captain Ellis didn't pay attention because he was looking at the enormous sphere that was growing bigger before his eyes. The hidden side of the moon was just in front of him and it was indescribable.
He didn't have time to linger because the radio began to sizzle. Wind control, base Andrew 07 Luna. State your identity, please. Over. Even before he could answer, two stealth fighters appeared with guns pointed at him. They must have had invisible technologies because he didn't see them coming. This is Captain Ellis, Echo Lima Lima India Sierra Kai 12 Fleet, Interceptor Zu 1A551, Zulu Uniform 1 Alpha 551. Request permission for flyby. Over. Andrew 7, what is the reason for your presence? Over. This is Zu 1A551, en route to Fort Terra 3. Copy that, stand by. Captain Ellis remained stationary, looking at the moon, remembering the first time he landed there in 2009. It was nothing but destruction, ruins, and desolation. Zuan, permission granted. Mandatory radio silence, please. Good ride, Captain Ellis. Over and out. The two fighters disappeared as quickly as they had appeared. They were still watching the intruder, but they were no longer seen, protected that they had to be by their shield of invisibility. Captain Ellis continued to fly remotely in parallel with the Zirconia, which was heading towards Terra 3 and the patrol mission around the American continent. Here are pictures of the Zirconia moving in front of the near side of the moon, from right to left and from top to bottom, from photo 1, top to right, towards the 4, bottom to left. It passes in front of the Sea of Tranquility, Mare Tranquillitatis, continues towards the Sea of Serenity, Mare Seneritatis, and towards the Earth. The Sea of Tranquility is probably the most famous lunar sea because it is where the eagle the lunar module of the American Apollo 11 mission, led by the astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin, landed on July 20th, 1969. Photo 3A below is an enlargement of a section of Photo 3, the Zirconia is a very long 1.5 mile vessel with a 656 feet boomeray filled with sensors and plasma guns. At the bow is the large panoramic room that Captain Ellis described earlier and from which he was looking onto space. You have just witnessed a direct communication from an alien pilot which is recorded in the first chapter of my book Artificial 